the scores have. So it goes without saying that uh, responding to climate change, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation, um, is pretty critical. It's got to a critical stage. Um, and the challenges have come into full view in recent times, particularly in Dunedin with more recent uh, intense and regular storms and obviously rising to mean sea level. It's interesting that prior to about 2016, we, didn't, we hadn't had a state of emergency declared in Dunedin since 1980. Then we had the 2015 floods when we should have probably declared a state of emergency. We had 2016. 2017 and yesterday. Now we didn't record yesterday because we didn't need to. But I kind of see a pattern emerging here um, that we can't ignore. So my, my council does take these issues very seriously and we have done for some time. Um, and in recent years some of the things that we've done that, that uh, address both mitigation and adaptation are for instance divesting from our shareholding in fossil fuel uh, exploration. We've consistently opposed uh, deep sea oil and gas exploration and extraction in New Zealand waters. Some people tell us it's none of our business since, uh, since the council uh, borderline doesn't go out to sea, but since we had the opportunity to pass that opinion, we decided we would. Uh, we're supporting sustainable transport, such as cycling and electric, electric vehicle use. Um, we've set a target to be net carbon zero for the city by 2050. Uh, and we're taking uh, short-term adaptation measures, uh, or short to medium term actually, in high-risk areas such as South Dunedin. And as Simon said, a lot of that is based on emerging information. So one of the reasons that uh, we take an adaptive planning approach is that we don't know as much as we would like to. And we, and we uh, would be, I think, imprudent to invest too much in really long-term measures until we know which ones are going to work. Um, but it's a balancing act. Um, but the, I think one of the most important aspects of uh, our effort in that area is engaging, meanif meaningfully engaging our community uh, on building resi resilience um, and identifying opportunities and options, not just for council, but for the community. Uh, because um, it's important, I think, that the community doesn't feel that it's just on the receiving end of other people's decisions, whether they are council or not. That it's important that the, cap, the community feels um, that it, it is enabled uh, to, to do stuff a lot in partnership with council and other authorities. And we're all, we've also put a bit of budget into uh, studying coastal erosion patterns. As much as anything that's around um, getting a head steer on what the threats might be to council-owned infrastructure. Uh, that, because that's really important. And in a country like New Zealand, a, a huge amount of, well, most of the people in New Zealand live around the coast. Uh, so it's, it follows that a good deal of the infrastructure, particularly council-owned infrastructure, is on the coast. So local government New Zealand has, has nearly finished a review of uh, the exposure of council-owned infrastructure to uh, sea level rise, slash coastal erosion, whatever, to climate change effects. Uh, and they're, they're only looking at exposure so far, and they've come up to billions of dollars already, without considering what the actual impact might cost. So this is pretty pretty serious stuff, uh, because the ongoing implications, for instance, if, if, if all, most of like the council's roads and their wastewater plants and their uh, water uh, distribution infrastructure, etc. So they're all near the coast and it's at risk, then, and it, and it gets compromised, clearly people not only can't live there because we can't support them, but businesses can't operate. And, uh, you know, businesses that sustain our community in terms of servicing it and earning a living, etc., they rely on the infrastructure just as much as uh, residents do. So the, the ongoing implications and of the threat to that infrastructure are pretty profound. But having said all that, about council's uh, responsibilities and council's uh, efforts, we recognise that flax roots know-how is a, an essential part of adaptive planning particularly. And um, I think with the blue skin, 
resilient communities trust is a leading example of flax roots community leadership and I uh, acknowledge that uh, here. Um, the recent initiative shown by the community in working to make Waitabi School the first solar school in Otago and connecting the school to the Blueskin Energy Network so that the benefits of this uh, locally generated clean energy are shared across the community is a prime example of excellent flax roots community leadership in, in action. Um, so this and that project not only contributes to boosting Dunedin's um, energy security, reducing our carbon emissions, it also sets a good example. There's no reason why that can't be replicated in other places across the city and across the region. Um, and Dunedin can provide an example to the rest of New Zealand in the way that collaboration and innovation can inspire solutions for the rest of the country. Uh, my observation after eight years as Mayor is that where we do best as a community is when we do things in partnership, whether it's the university and the council or the polytech and the chamber of commerce or whatever. Almost everything we do that's really successful is, um, is a partnership. So I'll be going back after listening to Simon and asking why things aren't working as well as they might uh, in the area of uh, South Dunedin research uh, because I want these partnerships to work. Uh, they, they have to. Um, the Climate Safe House is another prime example and uh, we certainly as a council look forward to collaborating on and supporting the build of that. Um, the recently released second generation district plan has new rules and we certainly need more adaptive planning in a, in a changing climate and it will be interesting to see how we can put the enabling aspects of that 2GP together with the Safe House concept and other um, initiatives of the similar type. So I, I endorse the principles in this report um, to guide action, practicing adaptive governance, investing in local communities and practicing good stewardship <coughs> for which we all have responsibility. Um, with my uh, LGNZ uh, President's hat on, uh, we continue to emphasize to our members uh, and as, as Neville said, 78 councils in New Zealand we continue to emphasise the importance of engaging with communities to adapt to climate change. And I, sh I should share uh, with you an interesting uh, discovery that we made. Not we made. Not long after I became uh, president of LGNZ, it uh, was last year, we did a roadshow and we visited every council in the country and the ambition of that was to, or the purpose of that, was to find out if the members all um, su still supported the, the business plan of, of local government New Zealand. Because we're basically an advocacy and uh, policy development organisation for our members. And the, the, the big things that we had uh, on our work plan were uh, climate change, uh, localism, that's devolving authority down into communities. Uh, housing, uh, well, well, housing wasn't there. It's climate change and localism and water. They were the three big ones. And the thing we got back was um, housing, but it was added on because we, we discovered that there were serious housing issues all around the country. And some of them have got quite a bit to do with climate change. But the other thing we discovered in, in, in just teasing out the climate change uh, subject was that while we expected councils to be increasingly conscious of the need to uh, put adaptation measures in place, what we were surprised at was the degree to which councils, even those few that are not on the coast, were keen to get mitigation measures in place, keen to address uh, reducing their carbon footprint, for instance. And, you know, I think it's to their credit because that's, it's not easy to convince your ratepayers to invest money, and it's their money, in measures that won't show a return for a generation. It's very difficult. So I, I, I took some heart from that, that around our country, it's not, not complete, uh, and there's some inconsistent attitudes, as there is right across our community, but uh, I think that local government uh, has, is becoming increasingly aware of the need not just to adapt, but to action, take some action that will uh, reduce the risk in the long run. But you can take some uh, heart from that. Um, 
Um, so, thank you to the Bluskin Resilient Communities Trust for proposing, planning, and running the workshops, for analysing all the results, and for your work to engage and motivate action. Uh, you do make a difference. Um, and certainly the complacency that might have existed in our community a few years ago is fast dissipating, apart from the old letters of the ODT. Um, it's, nothing's going to change that. Um, thank you also to the Deep South National Science Challenge for funding this report and the workshops and, and believing in community-led flax roots approach. And um, a big thank you to the experts uh, who contributed to the workshops and to all of the sponsors and materials, services, uh, contributing to the construction of the first sacrifice.